Growing up in Vancouver, I've enjoyed a great career in law, then politics. Since entering broadcasting in 1981, asking questions has been my living. From the moment we first learned about death as a young child, we begin the search. Now I want to train my sights on life's biggest questions. With an open mind, I want to ask different faiths what happens after we die. Welcome to The Search. Hi and welcome. Sufism and Sufi mystics have been a mystery to most people. Is it a dedicated part of the Islamic faith or a combination of multiple influences? My guest today, Bahram Haidari, has been studying Sufism since he was nine years old growing up in Iran. He's written books and produced television shows on the subject, and he joins me in studio. Bahram, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. What is a quick definition of Sufism? Sufism is a reality of religion. So if we can say that um, it's a reality of Islam. And by Islam, we mean submission. So if you look at anything in the world or anybody in the world, everybody is, is submitted. There is nothing that is not, in, uh, in, uh, is not submitted to the will of God. If we look at the planets, they're all spinning. If we look at the nature, they're doing a great job. And we do whatever we are supposed to do. So Sufism is a reality of religion. Usually there is a vacuum or a niche to be filled when something like your philosophy comes along. Uh, what was the niche or, or the need to be filled in Islam? Well, Islam, as I said, is, is a submission. Submission to the will of God. We believe that everyone is submitted because we're born without asking for it and we die without knowledge of it. So the best way to go about uh, Islam is to understand that everybody and everything is a expression or manifestation of God. Once you understand that, you have respect for everything. So when you say, uh, la ilaha illallah, nothing exists but God. That means everybody and everything is an expression of God. And once you are in that position, you know you cannot insult anybody or you cannot be ungrateful to whatever happens. Now, uh, Baram, I'd like to give you a couple of quotes that I picked up when I was looking at this. Uh, one from Sheikh Ahmad Zarouk, and he said, Sufis Sufism is a science whose objective is the reparation of the heart and turning it away from all else but God. Sheikh Ahmad ibn Najiba says, it is a science through which one can know how to travel into the presence of the divine, purify one's inner self from filth, and beautify it with a variety of praiseworthy traits. Now, that sounds good, but I'm not sure I quite understand what it means. Do I actually get into the presence of God? Do I see him, feel him, touch him, hear him? Yes, uh, we understand that there is a past and there's a future, but these are all only earthly concepts. Whatever happens, it happens in a presence, what they call hal. So we understand that if we get above our material understanding, we can always be in the presence of God. And that is where uh, we can see the reality and we can have respect for it. Our understanding is uh, once you die, you will be in that position. Your eye will, be, will open to that reality. So the best thing to do through your practice and your deed, if you can come to that understanding while you're alive. Uh, so we, you hear lots of concepts, for example, shaheed or martyrdom in Islam. It's a, Bad translation, we don't have martyrdom. Shaheed comes from uh, seeing, from witnessing. So that means everybody can witness God, witness the presence of God while they are alive. You don't have to kill anybody or you don't have to be killed. It is through your good deed and serving humanity you can come to that uh, elevation. So you're, you're saying then, Baram, if I've got this correctly, that these young men and women that strap explosives to themselves and blow themselves up in public places, they may think they're being martyrs, they may think there'll be a special reward, but that's not what Sufism says. Well, our understanding of Quran is, uh, there, is a, there is a concept called jihad, means uh, to move from ignorant into light. Uh, so, Jihad is, nothing, is not a political concept, the way it's been used today among politicians. It's basically 
mean what I said, moving from darkness or ignorant into light. Okay, so when a person comes to light, when they realize they all are expression of God and they belong to one reality, then they will have greater understanding. And because we never see God, there is no, there isn't God is not a human or any kind of form that we can uh, serve. The only way, can, only way we can serve God is through serving other humanity. And everybody has a different way of life. We cannot judge them. We must love everybody without condition or without any prejudice. One of the things I'm having a problem with here, uh, Baram, is what exactly is Sufism? Is it like, say, in Christianity, you have a number of different sects, you have Protestant churches, you have a Catholic church, and, and if we were to compare, you would be one of those? Or would it be more like, uh, let's say, the Anglican church, which has a low church and a high church, and the high church is different? Or is it something that stands on its own in Islam? No, Sufism is not a doctrine or is not uh, a sect. Sufism, as I said, is a reality of submission. So uh, when you say, I submit to the will of God, it doesn't mean that you do it through force. There is, in Quran it says there is no compulsion in religion. So you must do it through your own will and through love. So you submit uh, your will to the will of God by love, by uh, grace. If we understand the three great religions that came from East, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, Judaism stands for law. The law is very simple. They call it shariat in Islam. Is that we should respect and we should be grateful to the other human beings. Or we, we should, in today's term, we can say we should respect every individual's democratic right. That is shariat, right? So if I steal for, from you, I am actually denying you of your right. That is the meaning of the law. Now, in order for the law to be practiced, you cannot force people. It must happen through grace. And that's where Jesus Christ comes into it. Christianity comes into it. Before Christ, everything happened through force. Now, with coming of Jesus, he says, no, this, is, this must happen through your grace. So in Islamic understanding, so Moses stands for the law. Jesus comes for the grace vehicle of love from, to take you from where you are to the presence of God. Now, then Prophet Muhammad comes. He brings knowledge. He says, look, there is law, there is grace, but you must gain knowledge. And Can when, I stop you yeah, there sure. and ask you to hold that thought? Because sure. I think this is going to be a very interesting start to the next sec sure. segment. More of Sufism with my guest, Barham Haidari, when the search continues.
Welcome back to The Search. I'm Rafe Mayer. I'm again joined by Bahram Haidari, a Sufi mystic, author, and television producer. Bahram, we had just got to the fascinating point. We, the point. we have the arrival on the scene of Moses, and we have Jesus, and now we have Muhammad. And you were just telling us how that sort of completes the circle. Prophet Muhammad, the mission was to bring the news that everybody is expression of one God, and nobody is above anybody. So he said, in order to understand reality, by following the law of Moses and grace of Jesus, one must come to knowledge, follow knowledge, go wherever there is knowledge. And by knowledge, he meant uh, that uh, knowledge in undifferentiated uh, way. He's not talking about knowledge as we break it. For example, this is law, this is sociology, this is uh, sci psychology. That means marfat. So it's the duty of every seeker to find knowledge where, wherever it is, and doesn't matter who it belongs to. If it belongs to anybody, even unbeliever, you must find that knowledge because the way to God comes from knowledge and law and the grace. Now, many look at Islam as being a rather cruel religion, uh, cruel to women, women's place in society, uh, cruel in the sense of cutting off hands and that sort of thing is penalizing people cruel in the sense of penalizing a rape victim in uh, Saudi Arabia and so on. Why is that so? Because you're talking as a man of great peace. Well, <clears throat> when you look at Islam uh, or when you study Quran, it's, it is based on Torah and the uh, New Testament and Quran itself. So it's nothing. So the laws that uh, being recommended is the laws that were recommended in Torah or Christianity. But we understand what Prophet Muhammad said, this is for this time. In future, this must change. You must move with science. His argument was that God is not outside you. He's with you, outside you, above you, under your feet. Everywhere that you look is God. Therefore, God is not a person or some kind of expression of your thought. God is a reality. And you are a limited being. As a limited being, if you want to understand something that is infinite and undifferentiated and absolute, you must break all your idols. As long as you are idol worshiping, you're going to fall into all kind of uh, stupid ideas of cutting hand and killing this and that. Quran specifically says, if you kill an innocent person, it's like killing the whole humanity. Well, I must press you a little bit on this, if I may, uh, uh, Baram. You haven't really explained why ayatollahs in Iran have done what they've done, or why Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia do what they do in terms of cruelty. And uh, I, I guess what I'm asking are you, is your uh, your notion, Sufism, is that in order to correct the Islam as being practiced now in many countries? Well, every religion or anything. If we, you and I read the book, you take your take, I take my own. So it's about our perception, you know, our background, our culture, and the way we've been brought up. Everybody define religious book the way they want to, every word by word. So in every religion you see there has been failures, not by, for example, the founders, but by those preachers and the one who came and advocate religion. The corporate because church, they have, my, my, my priest calls it, the corporate church. By all means, because it's all about perception. Now, we understand, for example, you, when, you, when we talk about peace, peace has a meaning for you, has a meaning for me. But we understand there is a universal peace and there is a universal love that Jesus Christ is talking about. And that is totally different to what you and I express. The same way goes with Prophet Muhammad. What he expresses is totally different. He's talking about that universal understanding of unity of being. La ilaha illallah, that means you are obligated to respect anybody or anyone you see, whether it is any part of creation. Therefore, as a Muslim, you must be submitted and you must respect every part of uh, whatever happens to you. Are you personally horrified when you see the victim of a rape go to jail? Of course, of course. I mean... Uh, but the I, Wahhabi sect obviously aren't horrified well, because well, that's, that's the way they do business. Well, Wahhabis, uh, they do things the way they want to. They justify. These are pre-Islamic thinking. When Prophet Muhammad came, he came to get rid of those pre-Islamic thinking. Uh, that was very destructive. It was about idol worshiping. 
It was about judgment. It was about greed. It was about lack of respect for humanity, women, and so. So what he did, Prophet Muhammad did, the first thing he did, he freed the slaves. Bilal Habashi was the first man, a black man that he freed. He came, he said, do not kill your women because they, they were, the Arabs were killing women. He said, no, women are sign of beauty of God. So wherever he went, he liberated uh, the people, and that was the idea. Now, these things get obviously uh, abused by people who take over later on. And we, in history, we see all kind of wars and killing in the, the, the point name being of God that, and point, religion. The point being that Sufism is against that sort of thing. Of course. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit about the afterlife from the point of view of Sufism. And during the break, you're going to see a very interesting dance called the Swirling Dervishes. We have another segment to go with my guest, Baram Haidari, when the search continues after the break. Welcome back to The Search. I'm again joined in my discussion on Sufism with my guest, Bahram Haidari. Uh, Bahram, we just saw a dance, I believe you call it the Swirling Dervishes? Whirling Dervishes. Whirling Dervishes. Where, where does that fit into? Uh, 
Sama, Sama means hearing, hearing that beautiful music that is played by creation all the time. And it's the expression of passion for the beloved. In Sufism, uh, God is beloved. You are the lover. In this trinity of love, you are seeking. And you want to get in the presence. So you act a drunken as Jesus served that glass of wine, that uh, you feel drunken and you express yourself through art, music, uh, da uh, dancing, somehow you hear that all the time. That dance goes on for a long, long time. Don't they ever fall down dizzy? Mm -hmm. I, it's a practice, yeah. It's kind of a prayer at the same time. Now, we've, we've mentioned, you've mentioned Jesus on a couple of occasions during this interview. I'd like to get into the whole question of death, the soul, the spirit, the afterlife, and, and so on. Uh, what do you say happens to people uh, after they die? And, I, and the second question is, does it happen differently for me because I'm not one of yours than it does for you? Well, uh, in Islam, there is no death. Everything rich adds or everything returns to God. So as we see, everybody has to ascend duality. As long as we live on this earth, there is day, there is night, there is beauty, there is ugly, there is what we like, what we don't like. These are the dualities. As we see, Jesus ascended duality. Prophet Muhammad ascended duality. Once you ascend, you get to that point, Everything is beautiful, and every creation, all part of creation, seen or unseen, is beauty, beautiful. So what we understand, as Quran says, everything withers into God at all moment and changes and renews itself. You are sitting here, I'm sitting here, this table, everything in nature withers or dies and renews itself. In Christianity, we call, we call that born again. But this only happens to an eye of mystic. Mystic says that, sees that, and he says, you are not the person that you were a moment ago. And he is not the moment, a person that he was a moment ago. That's why you're always fresh and you always have, you never get depression. You see this beauty changes and changes. So nothing dies, everything gets elevated and ascends this material world in order to go to that pure world. Can there a no Christian, death. can a Jew uh, become a, a member of Sufism or have them as, as their, their way of life and still maintain their old religion as Christian or Jew? Of course, first of all, the only judge is God. And he, he, his judgment or his idea of punishment is not the way we think. His punishment and his judgment is love. He takes everybody, despite their religion, their ideas, and he takes everybody back to himself. We all like a drop, we will fall into the ocean of love and we disappear. So everybody is a mystic. Everybody is, is, has that potential to be a mystic. I cannot determine. We're not allowed to convert people. Christianity is a great religion. Uh, Judaism is, Buddhism is. And one, one, the person starts seeking knowledge and find who they are and they understand, I am not who I present myself. Behind me, there is a reality. That reality calls itself I. I say my hand, my thought, my soul. Who is that I who says my soul, my thought, my idea? That is God himself who is behind me. Now, very quickly, because I'm not going to run a minute to go, but Islam is made up of several different groups, Shia and uh, uh, Sunni and so on and so forth. And I gather that you transcend all of those. And I have this quote from Victor Danner in, this, in, in the is Islamic tradition. It says, Sufism has influenced the spiritual life of the religion, Islam, to an extraordinary degree. There's no domain in the civilization of Islam that has remained unaffected by it. Is that accurate? You can say it's accurate. Yeah. <laughs> and it continues to be? It continues to be because we, we all have to find and seek knowledge, find who we are in order to know God. Prophet Muhammad said, in order to know God, you must know who you are. Are you welcome in places like Iran, your old home, Iraq, Egypt? Indonesia? I haven't been out of... No, but I mean, the, a Sufism. I hope welcome. so. I don't know. And uh, You're not discriminated against There are actively. Sufis. Uh, obviously, there are many Sufis who live in Iran, Iraq, uh, Syria, in many countries. Uh, but Su Sufism, because we don't advertise or we do not recruit or we do not convert people, is a small number. Uh, so therefore, uh, it's very difficult to, to go among Sufism because there is not application form. They tell you, look, come when you're ready. But anyone can follow the path of Sufism. Anybody. Of this is belong to God and we all creation and you are, nothing belongs to us. You are, sir, a fascinating man. And I wish we had more time to talk about this. And I, I want to thank you very much for coming in. I hope it hasn't been too big an ordeal for you. Thank you. <laughs>
Many, many thanks to my guest on this edition of The Search, Baram Haideri, a Sufi mystic and author. Have a thought or a comment you want to share? Well, I'll tell you how, how to send it in when The Search continues. I do hope you've enjoyed this edition of The Search and have found out something interesting about Sufism. If you have a comment, suggestion, or just a simple rant, pass it along. My home in cyberspace is rafeonline.com. Thanks again to my guest, Baram Haidari, a Sufi mystic and TV producer. Thank you for watching and learning on this journey with me. For everybody here at The Search, I'm Rafe Mayer.